reading for today, of course, comes from Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read originally from verse 18 to 25th to hear the story again. So listen to the word of God. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Amazing God. Thank you for this beautiful morning, this Christmas Eve Sunday that only happens every eight years or so. And thank you that you have given us this gift to come to worship you in this important day. Bless this congregation, bless each child, each youth, each adult, each mom, each dad, grandfather, grandmother, uncle, cousin, all of us, that we come here to worship as a family. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was Christmas Eve 1992. I know, I'm getting, getting out there. I was 14 years old. You can do the math. The oldest child of four, uh, three sisters and one brother. It was time for us to move to the a new city, coming from a little town from the farm. And my father built, a, bought a piece of land and then he built a small house. He got some piece of log and then took it to the city. And our Christmas Eve in 1992 was in a house that was still being built. But that night, as we are very Christian, uh, we grew up in a Presbyterian home, so my mom and my father said, even though we're not totally ready to live in this house, but we have to go to worship, we have to go to church. So we went that evening to a worship service. For the first time in a new city where we did, we did not know anybody. We went and in the, after the service, we introduced ourselves to some people in the church. This was actually a Moyobamba Presbyterian Church where 16 of you went with me this summer. So you, if you are here, you, you can think of the city of Moyobamba and the church where we visited that Sunday. So we went that Sunday, uh, that service on the Christmas Eve, and we went home. You know that in Peru and in other Latin American countries, Christmas Eve is the main day because that's when we have a worship service and after service at midnight, we have this big banquet with turkey or pork and with rice and beans and all these ingredients and with big sweet bread called panettone and we have a hot chocolate called the chocolatada and we have all this music and we have many like uncles and cousins and all these people. Yet in our house that Christmas Eve night, it was only my parents, my three sisters and my brother, 
with no money. My other families were in other parts of the, the country and they were not with us. And of course, we were grateful for being as a family together, but we wanted to have that meal. I wanted to have that meal. So we went home and my mom was like, okay, maybe we'll just get something here. We had to start fire, we just tried to cook something. And all of a sudden somebody knocked our house. And we're like, who's, who's coming? Maybe this is what's... And then there was this lady, her name is Marie Lou. I still remember until now. And she had this big basket. And she had a big chicken, all the ingredients. She had all these uh, things that we, you use for a Christmas Eve dinner in Peru. And she had a panettone, and she had a and hot chocolate to get ready. And we were like, this is God's provision. I remember my mom just teared up and say, this is really wonderful. And all of us, of course, we kids, you're like, oh, we're going to have a great Christmas Eve dinner. And we got together. My mom prepared the meal. And we all had our family devotional that night. And we had a great Cena de Noche Buena is what we call it in Spanish. A Christmas Eve dinner. When I read the story of Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus, I think of a family also in economic and emotional distress. I think of a family in need. I think of a family who was in a world of injustice. Do you think it was easy for Joseph to marry a girl that was already pregnant? Do you think Jesus wanted, excuse me, do you think Joseph wanted to adopt a child that was not his own? Do you think Joseph felt a little left out in the story? As a carpenter, and if you read the Christmas stories, we don't see many references to Joseph, except in Matthew and very briefly in Luke. But the story is more about the angels, about Mary, and of course about baby Jesus, the shepherds, and everybody else. Yet, jo yet Joseph, I know it's too small, but you just picture Joseph here. <laughs> yet Joseph trusted in God and trusted in God's plan. Maybe today, many dads are feeling like Joseph. A little left out. Maybe it's all about the presents. It's all about the decorations. Like in my case, who organizes the day where, where we put up the Christmas tree? Who keeps the tradition of turning the advent calendar pictures each day? Who reads the Christmas children's books every day? Who makes sure the presents for family members are all wrapped up and ready? And of course, my beautiful wife. I can picture Joseph feeling a little left out, a little confused, maybe even frustrated, and discouraged in the relationship. Yet Joseph knew deep in his heart that even in the times of uncertainty, maybe even loneliness, trust in Jesus, Trusting and obeying God was the way to go. Somehow, God was going to provide and show the way. And God did. Matthew 1.24 says, When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do and took Mary home as his wife. So how did Joseph handle the situation? Joseph supported Mary and nourished the relationship by trusting God and taking care of this family, even though it was not the way he planned to have a family. By listening and obeying God, even when he was not understanding every part of the story, Joseph supported his family by being kind, merciful, and by sharing his faith with Mary and by raising this child in his life. Friends, this Christmas story is about relationships. 
But it's even more than that. It's about God restoring relationships. Joseph was, of, was upset with Mary. Joseph was confused about the new baby. Yet when Jesus was born, Jesus Christ restored the broken family and worked each relationship into a beautiful story. Furthermore, God and Jesus Christ brings together the wise men, the shepherds, all the animals into one place in worship, in a gathering. Therefore, friends, Jesus Christ also brings us together in this place and gives us this possibility to come together in our greater family, a church family, our community, and our world family. We, the whole world, all of us, we are a family. Today, as you, as you saw, the director of children's ministry, Lori Juarez, gave each Sunday school participant a nativity set. So children, as you take this nativity set, think of that nativity set as your family. Which of the character do you identify the most? Perhaps you feel like the shepherd who was forgotten in the field. Yet God called them to see baby Jesus and to spread the news. Or maybe you are more like Mary, who was innocent, young, and yet willing to give herself to God. Or maybe, like me, you feel like Joseph, who was called to provide and support from behind the scenes. Maybe you feel like you are the wise man. Do you feel important? You know astronomy, you know science, and you feel like God has blessed you with the knowledge to find a way and to help others find a way. But yes, you still need God's guiding star to lead you in the right direction. I hope you're not the innkeeper who rejected a place for Jesus. Well, I hope you are not King Herod, who was a mean guy, the villain in the story. But whoever you relate to the most in the story, ask yourself, how are you trusting God and supporting and loving your family in this Christmas and this new year, 2018? On Christmas 1992, as a teenager myself, I didn't have any money or a decent house. But we were together as a family, praying God and thanking God for sending Jesus for his salvation. Today, 25 years later, God has blessed me with a beautiful family. I'm married to a wonderful person, Lori, and a great children, Paul Santiago and Ella Gloria. We are not a perfect marriage, nor a perfect family, but we are trusting God, and we are obeying God's call as we go into the future. So today, friends, let us all go and follow the example of Joseph, Mary, the shepherds, the wise men, and let us all gather together in worship let us trust God. Let us be more supportive to each other. Let us be more understanding to each other. Let us be more patient with, in our community, with other friends, with people who think different than us. And in the end, because of the faith and obedience of Jesus Christ, we can all turn, to, turn out to be a wonderful family. Your family is beautiful and wonderful, even when sometimes doesn't feel like it. I would like to finish this story and this message by sharing a Christmas version of 1 Corinthians 13. One of my friends on Facebook shared this just recently. I actually had to change the ending of my sermon because I think this was more, more appropriate. So I found this in a website called Carl Bart for Dummies. Carl Barth for Dummies that was posted on Facebook. I want to 
can say so many things about that. Karl Barth, I, I love Karl Barth, one of the great theologians, but I'll save that for an, another sermon. But here's the message. 1 Corinthians 13, Christmas version. If I decorate my house perfectly with plate bows, strands of twinkling lights and shiny balls, but do not show love to my family, I'm just another decorator. If I slave away in the kitchen, baking dozens of Christmas cookies, preparing gourmet meals and arranging a beautiful adorned table at meet, meal time, but do not show love to my family, I'm just another cook. If I work at the soup kitchen, sing Christmas carols in the nursing home, and gave all that I have to charity, but do not love to my family, it profits me nothing. If I trim the spruce with shimmering angels and crochet snowflakes, attend a myriad of holiday parties and sing in the choir cantata, but do not focus on those I love the most, I have missed the point. Love stops the cooking to hug a child. Love sets aside the decorating to kiss the spouse. Love is kind, though hurried and tired. Love doesn't envy another's home that has coordinated Christmas china and table linens. Love doesn't yell at the kids to get out of the way, but is thankful that they are to be in the way. Love doesn't give only to those who are able to give in return, but rejoices in giving to those who can't. Love bears all things. Believe all things, hopes all things, endure all things. Love never fails. Video games will break. New iPhones will get old. Pearl necklaces will be lost. Actually, don't get pearl necklaces to, to people, but pearl necklaces will be lost. <laughs> golf clubs will rust. So if you're given a golf club this Christmas, they will, they will rust. But the gift of love endures forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Merry Christmas.